Well, hey everybody. In today's episode, we're gonna be doing a little 80s flashback. In particular, we're gonna be looking at a piece of code from the 80s. Happens to be a single line of code. And this code has been covered in magazines. There's been a complete book written on this one line of code. So we're gonna dig in and see what this line of code is all about. So our journey is going to start back in 1982 with the release of the Commodore 64. Now everyone has heard of the Commodore 64, but not as many people know that it's actually the best selling computer model of all time. And the numbers vary, the estimates vary, but there's an estimated 11 to 17 million Commodore 64s that were sold. And even more surprising, if we look back at the years 83 to 86, the Commodore 64 actually had 30 to 40% market share and outsold all other computer models, whether they were IBM PC compatibles, all Apple's computers, or even all the Atari computers. You could pick one up in 82 for about $595, uh, you know, which in today's dollars is about $1,500. So let's talk about the machine. So as you can see here, the machine booted with about 38,000 bytes free and that's out of a total of 64K of memory. And so just to put that in perspective, you could easily fill every byte of a Commodore 64 with just kind of your average everyday image sitting on a web page. You know, the average web page these days is has grown to over two megabytes. Uh, you know, in terms of processing power, the Commodore 64 had a, had a 6510 processor in it running at the fast speed of one megahertz. It also had some interesting graphic and sound hardware in it as well, which we're not gonna get into maybe in another video, but it was definitely ahead of the rest of the machines in the market at that time. Now, when you boot up a Commodore 64, you're actually presented with a basic programming language prompt. And that's kind of interesting because most of the computers of that day booted into some kind of disk operating system prompt, uh, like DOS on the PC, but not with the Commodore 64. The Commodore 64 was waiting for you to enter code. Now, the Commodore 64's basic programming language, it was actually a modified version of Microsoft Basic, and that's the same basic that was created by Bill Gates and Paul Allen. And there's an interesting story around the negotiation between Bill Gates and Jack Tramiel, who was the CEO of Commodore. And the negotiation was around putting basic on every Commodore machine. So Bill Gates offered Jack the opportunity to have basic on every machine for the low cost of a dollar a machine. Uh, Jack's response to that was, Bill, I'm already married. And so Jack ended up negotiating that down to a $50,000 one-time license, which in retrospect looks like a pretty good move. I compute that cost per Commodore 64 at about four tenths of a cent. And obviously Commodore shipped a lot of machines that weren't Commodore 64. So Jack Tamil did pretty well in that negotiation. So of course we're here to look at this single line of code. And this was a line of code that I knew about. It was sort of the equivalent of playing chopsticks if you walked up to a Commodore 64 with a, a blinking cursor. And I'd honestly forgotten all about this line of code until I saw a very interesting title on a book at MIT Press. It's a book that Nick Montfort put together. And the title of the book actually is the line of code. So you can see it here. It's 10 print CHR dollar sign, and then in parens, 205.5 plus RND of one. Then there's a semicolon, a colon, and a go to 10. So that's the mysterious line. So this book uh, definitely got me re-interested re in this line of code. And it's a very interesting read if you are very into code and kind of the aesthetics of code really. But let's uh, step back and let's really find the origin of this line of code. And then let's step through the code to see what it's doing. So the first place anyone would have been likely to encounter this code was actually in the Commodore 64's user guide. And that user guide had a small section on the basic programming language. 
and you'll find on page 53 this little snippet of code. And by the way, if you're interested in looking at that user guide or the programming manual, uh, you can actually get those online at archive.org and I'll put a link to those in the episode notes. But let's take a look at this code real quickly. Now this is actually a three line version of the code. And as you see here, we have three different statements. And in the basic language, we uh, label our statements by numbers. And so line 10 just basically clears the screen. And then 20 is printing a character out. And we'll talk in a minute about what character that is. And then line 40 is just going back to 20. So we're kind of in an infinite loop around that. So that's the first occurrence of this. The one line occurrence first appeared actually in a magazine. And that magazine was the Run Computer Magazine. It was really a magazine for Commodore 64 and VIC-20 users. And that, you know, at that time, there was no Stack Overflow, no Google Search, nothing like that. So everything was either magazines or bulletin board systems or one of the few books that was available. Now, Run Magazine had a column in it uh, called Magic. And that column was run by a guy named Lewis Sander. And that column was really just a set of tips and tricks that people would send in, and they'd pay you up to $50 for your tip, which wasn't too bad for 84. Now, in July of 1984, someone submitted this to Magic. They say, amazing one-liner. Here's one of the best one-liners I've ever seen. It works on the VIC and the C64, drawing a continuous maze that is very interesting. And if we turn the page, and here at the top, we have our one line bit of code. Let's highlight that so we can see it a little better. And if this looks a little different to you, it's just because it's using eight rather than 10 uh, as the statement number. You might also notice too that it passes eight to the random function rather than one. We'll talk about that in a minute. But other than that, it's the same exact code as what we saw on the front of Nick Monfort's book. So with that, and we've already gotten a hint as to what this does, it apparently makes interesting mazes and we kind of saw that already. Let's dig in and, and see what this code does and how it does it. And we should also thank Dan Kruger as well for posting this code all those years ago. Now we've seen a few versions of this code, so we really need a canonical version to walk through. So let's just use the code that's on the front of Nick Monfort's book. All right, let's dig into this code. So up first is the number 10, and 10 here is our line number. So basic as a programming language uses line numbers, 10 is sort of the convention for your, your first line. You might remember though that Dan Kruger in his submission to Commodore Run Magazine used an eight there. And so why did he do that? Well, he might have just liked eight better. There's nothing wrong with using eight. More practically, the number eight actually saves you a byte. And why is that? Well, you might look at the line number and say, Okay, 10, that takes two bytes. Eight only takes a single byte, so there's my savings. It actually doesn't turn out to be true because Commodore uses two bytes for every line number, so you don't save there. Where you actually save is at the end of the line where it says go to 10. And if you have go to eight instead, you're using one less character, which is one less byte. Sometimes on a machine with only 64K bytes, that uh, can matter a lot. In this program, not so much, given it's such a small program. Uh, Nick Modfort has a observation about this as well in his book, which is just that eight has the nice look of sort of an infinite symbol. And so we've got an infinite loop going on here. So it's kind of a nice thing to put here aesthetically. Remember too that Dan also put an eight within the uh, random function which you're gonna get to in the middle. So we'll come back to that. Okay, up next is uh, print, but actually before that there's a space. And one thing to say about uh, Microsoft Basic or Commodore Basic is that you don't actually have to have the spaces. The way the uh, parsing works, you can actually remove every single space and your code's gonna work the same way, which is kind of an interesting feature. Not that common in programming languages. Uh, we usually keep them though for readability. So up next we have print. And so print is that function that has been around since the begin almost the beginning of programming languages. I think it was certainly in, in Fortran on the early IBM versions of Fortran. But it has always meant, uh, it, well, early on it meant actually print to a printer, and then it just sort of hung on. And these days it means print to a display, and that's what it does here as well. Up next, we've got our CHR dollar sign or char dollar sign function. 
And to see what that does, let's take a look at the Commodore user manual. So taking a look at that, so char dollar sign, it takes a number, it actually happens to be an integer, and that number identifies an ASCII code. And what this function does is it takes that number and then converts it to the ASCII character represented by that code. All right, so if we take a look at the example down here, for instance, if we call CHR with 65, that's the ASCII code that represents an uppercase A. And that first line down there actually prints out the letter A based on that. So that's how it works. Now things are going to be just a little bit more complicated in this example, because as we're going to see, we're going to be passing numbers which are above ASCII that are greater than ASCII codes. So we'll take a look at that in a second and see what the effect of that is as well. So to understand what we're passing to CHR dollar sign, we actually have a little addition going on in here. And so we have the number 205.5, which is clearly a floating point number, plus the result of calling RAND RND on the number one. So what does RND do? Let's again return to our Commodore users manual. And we can see there that it returns a random number between zero and one, floating point number. And remember that computers generate pseudo random numbers. And so to do that, they use what's called a seed. So if we pass it a positive number, we always get the same seed. And we always have the same sequence of uh, pseudo random numbers. You can pass it zero as well, which seeds the, uh, the call uh, based on the clock. And so you would get a different set of pseudo random numbers every time you did that. I actually think that's a more interesting way uh, perhaps to write this one liner. So I'm not sure that wasn't done, but that's what RAND does. So given all that, let's take a look at what is getting passed ultimately to the CHR dollar sign function. And what we have is we have 205.5 uh, floating point value being added to the result of a call to RND, which is gonna be a number between zero and one, floating point number. So what we're gonna ultimately end up with is a number between 205.5 and 206.5 somewhere in that range. Okay, but CHR dollar sign doesn't take a floating point number, it takes an integer. So the way the Commodore deals with that, the way BASIC deals with that, is just by truncating that value. So we've got a 50-50 chance here of either passing 205 or of passing 206. Now those numbers are above the ASCII code. Remember that ASCII only goes up to 127. So these are in the range of what is called Petsky. And that's a nickname for the character codes which are sitting above ASCII on a Commodore 64. It's called PETSCI because a lot of the models of computer that were made before the Commodore 64 were actually called Commodore PETS. So that's where that comes from. Now, unfortunately, the Commodore manual doesn't actually list out all of these PETSCI codes. Uh, but if we return to that initial code listing we looked at, then actually there's a hint there as to what these character codes are. So let's take a look at that. And you'll see it right here. It says uh, if you print 205 and 206, as a CHR of 205 and 206, then you will see two right side graphic characters on the M and N keys. Well, I think they could have just put what those characters were in here. But let's go take a look at the actual keyboard of the Commodore 64 and see what graphic character is sitting on the right side. And so here we have it. It looks like we've got the equivalent of a slash and a backslash, just two diagonal graphic characters there. So let's just bring this all together. So each time CHR dollar sign is called, it's going to pass either 205 or 206. And that is going to return either that forward slash looking graphic or the backslash looking graphic. Now let's go ahead and finish this because we're almost done. So we've got a semicolon right after that, that function call. And what the semicolon does, it just tells print not to display a new line at the end of what it's printing. So the next time print gets called, it'll be on the same line. Uh, next, we've got a colon, which is just a line separator, allows us to put more than one line on a single line of basic. And finally, we have go to 10, which is really just an unconditional jump back to line 10, which is the line we're on, so it's an infinite loop. All right, so now that we see how this works, we just sit in an infinite loop, and every time through the loop, we print randomly one of two uh, graphic characters, 
and let's see what this does. All right, so let's get this typed in. Print, care string, 205.5, plus random of one, semicolon, colon, go to 10. Of course, the one thing we haven't talked about, the run command. So let's run it. And as you can see, we immediately start getting this really intricate maze drawn. Totally pseudo-random. Now, one thing we should talk about is something called generative algorithms. And we have one here. So a generative algorithm is an algorithm that typically is based on very simple rules. But the thing about a generative algorithm is it has behavior when you run it that you, you couldn't have predicted beforehand. And I think this falls into that category. We've got some incredibly simple rules here. All we're doing is just randomly picking between two graphical characters. And yet we end up generating some very nice complex mazes. Now there's a lot of other generative algorithms out there in the world. So maybe we'll make that the topic of a future video. And so with that, I thank you for joining me on this 80s flashback. If you like this kind of thing, whether it's the 80s as retro aspect or the generative algorithm aspect, let me know in the show notes. Maybe we'll do some future videos on those topics. And with that, thank you. This is Eric Freeman, and I will see you in a future video. Don't forget to subscribe.